So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 19th annual Prevent Cancer Foundation Quantitative Imaging Workshop. I can hardly believe I'm saying those words, I, that we've been doing this 19 years in a row, but we have. And I think most of you know that it, this meeting was the um, inspiration, the, or the inspiration for this meeting was Dr. Jim Mulshine. It, all the credit goes to him. It was his brainchild. And the foundation is so happy that he's our scientific director and that we were able to just um, help a little bit. And, but we're just delighted to have been involved with it all these years. I want to start by thanking the um, members of the steering committee. This meeting is put on by volunteers, as I think all of you know. Our steering committee consists of Jim Mulshine, Rick Avila, Raul San Jose Estepar, Anita McLaughlin, Bruce Pienson, Al Rizzo, and David Yankelovitz. And I think it's appropriate that we take a minute and give them a round of applause, because they work hard. <laughs> I'd also like to call out Al Rizzo again, because thanks to Al, the American Lung Association has, for now, I think this is the third year, been our partner in presenting this meeting. And so we are just so grateful for their support and honored that they would attach their name to this meeting. So thank you, Al. The other um, group that needs to be thanked are our meeting planners. I wanna start by thanking our staff member, who's our conference planner, Adrian Harkness. A Adrian is who makes sure that I stay in line and don't put the wrong date on a letter, which I did. Um, she, she makes it all happen, capably assisted by Liz Hall, who's been in touch with many of you over the last weeks and months about uh, logistics for the meeting, content for the meeting. And finally, Stacy Ogren, who is outside, and if anything, if you need anything, Stacy is your woman. Um, I don't think, I, there are many, many other staff members. Uh, there we go. And their names are up there. I, I encourage each of you to read the names. Our, our president and COO, Jody Hoyos, is here. And I think every other name uh, listed in that group is here. But I encourage you, if you see their name on a name tag, please say thank you for all they do all year long. Anyway, I'd also encourage you to learn more about the foundation. We have a, an overhauled, revamped website. We've been told that it actually it is very good. We had a meeting yesterday. This is about something entirely different, but with some people from the King Hussein Cancer Foundation in Amman, Jordan. And they asked if they could distribute our content because they thought our website was so good. So that's a real tribute to our communications group who, who really have done a wonderful job with the website. So please check it out. And please also follow us on social media. We have a strong presence on Twitter, <laughs> LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever social media you like to access, read about us. Now, without further ado, I am going to turn it over to our fearless leader, Dr. Jim Mulshine. We, as I said, we are honored that Jim is the scientific director of this foundation. He co-chairs our grants review panel, and I think he's, I don't want to count how many years he's been a member of our board, because I think he would say that's long enough and I'm, <laughs> I'm out. Um, Jim, I think you know, was at the National Cancer Institute for some 25 years, and he has held a variety of positions at Rush University. So without any more comment from me, I will turn it over to Jim. Uh, thank you very much, Bo, and thank you all for coming. Um, you're all very busy people, and for you to invest this kind of time uh, is very important for uh, the success of this effort. And this effort, the Quantitative Imaging Workshop, is a, is a conversation about innovation in a critical space. You know, the first thing we always have to ground ourselves in, in thinking about this, is this started with lung cancer, the leading cause of cancer death across the world a miserable disease, an aggressive disease, a, uh, 
a disease that progress has been very slow in, that we finally, fortunately, through contributions of people in this room, have a solution that is addressing part of that mortality burden. And we want to bring it to as many people as rapidly as possible. But it turns out imaging is vibrant in terms of its ever-expanding capabilities. And we're going to talk about what, that, what those capabilities are and how they can be harnessed to not only affect and, and detect lung cancer, but related tobacco-related diseases and other diseases. And so this workshop is actually the brainchild of Rick Avila, David Yankelevitz, Stefan Schaller, and myself 20 years ago talking about, you know, what are we going to do about this stuff? You know, lung cancer, if we can't see it, we can't treat it, we can't cure it. If we can see it, we can do something about it. Stefan Schaller was head of, of algorithm development for Siemens at the time. Rick was head of CAD and algorithm development at GE at the time. And David and I were, you know, we're just kind of looking for things to do. So um, uh, it's been a remarkable 20-year conversation. And I want to thank everybody. Um, if I can have my slides, um, I want to just echo the sponsors allow this to happen. The sponsors are heroes because this is an emerging space. There are no products here yet. There's going to be products in the future, very important products. But for right now, this is, this is aspirational on the part of the sponsors in helping us have a pre-competitive conversation about a strategically important opportunity to improve health. And then I want to echo Bo's absolutely appropriate um, um, acknowledgement of the contribution of her staff and of the steering committee in contributing hours and hours of donated time to advancing this discussion. This is the most labor-intensive conference that I've ever seen. Alice smiling now. <laughs> but we spent a lot of time over the course of the year thinking about what are the strategic opportunities and how do we bring all these divergent themes together in a productive way. So thank you. And um, it's very interesting time in, uh, in the world of lung cancer screening, in the world of imaging, and in the world of medicine because we're transitioning from a traditional uh, reimbursement system related to activities to a potentially more efficient and more patient-friendly, actually, uh, way of managing population health, thinking about health in large numbers of individuals and how do we get there. So uh, next slide, please. Or, oh, I can advance the slides, I see. Um, we have some goals of what we'd like to accomplish over the next two days with your help. And so you, you can see the slides. We um, obviously, I just talked about population health. Population health is about looking at health outcomes, but it's also about aligning incentives to get there. And so we have some of the world's experts with us to talk about that. Now, some hardcore coders who are developing algorithms for AI in the next iteration of whatever might say, well, who are they and why do I care? Well, they're the ones that are going to create this scaffolding that's going to allow innovation to be nurtured through the very, very expensive process of validation. Does this work? Does this work in this population versus that population? And all the other things that are done appropriately, because we're talking about prevention tools. Prevention tools aren't for an individual. We don't vaccinate only rich people. We, in prevention, are concerned about all of our species across the globe, wherever they may be, whatever they're doing. And that's an incredible developmental regulatory challenge. And if we don't have incentives so that we can fund that process, it doesn't happen. The tools that we're going to talk about right now, these aspirational AI tools, workflow tools, whatever, are, are very complicated. And to, and to move that forward, we have to have the incentives aligned to allow this to happen in a way that benefits as many people as possible in whatever settings we're dealing with. So um, in addition to that, we also want to think about the driver of this. The tip of the spear here is imaging. Imaging is, is wonderful, but it's complicated. 
and we're going to hear about that as we have over the last 19 years. And um, we got to work on understanding how to make this work not only at Mass General, but at a community hospital in Slovenia. And, and, and that's an incredible challenge. But we have tools, and we got to think about how we can make this robust. And one of the biggest problems that we have in this regard right now, though, is that this is a secret. Beyond this room, there's very few people that are aware of these opportunities. And so if people aren't aware of it, it's, it doesn't exist. It doesn't get funded. It doesn't get the bandwidth. It requires amongst hospital administrators and other communities that are so important in making this thing happen. So we have to do a better job of communicating. And we're going to be talking about that message. And we're going to be talking about, in a session with David Yankelovitz, about bringing that message more clearly to the distinct populations involved that are fundamentally important in participating in this process. And then um, we want to keep moving and thinking about where imaging is today. And we have a couple of sessions that uh, Rick Avila and Raul Estepar will help us with that are profoundly exciting about where imaging is, where computer science is, where the inner interplay is, and then bringing that into not just publications in high visibility journals, but into actual tools that are, worked, that are working in community hospitals, in ambulatory clinics, in ambulatory imaging centers across the world. So that's a, a very important challenge. So this is a workshop. A workshop is a discussion, as I said. And how we organize this workshop is to think about questions. And we have a whole variety of experts. We have representatives from 17 countries and heavy, con uh, he heavy contribution from North America. And we're going to be hearing about all kinds of things. And the way we pull this together, this multidisciplinary, different voices, different prisms, is to have all our experts comment about questions. From their perspective, what are the issues? So we get this cross rough so we can move towards synthesis to get this wrapped together to actually achieve something. Um, we have a very complicated process for this conversation. We had to have two breakout groups. We have a clinical breakout group and a technical breakout group so that we could kind of keep, you know, a group of, of, of multidisciplinary uh, individuals together in these conversations. And we start out with that later on today. We have an initial discussion. We run through the questions. We get people's thoughts. And this is a Zoom, in, you know, uh, affected workshop so that we also, by virtue of having these breakout conversations, can get the benefit of the thoughts and the perspectives of people across the world, actually, so that we distill down to really important issues. And there's a clinical component, and we're going to be talking about the title we get is, uh, we, we gave it is Getting Serious About Public Health Impact of Thoracic CT Imaging in High Risk Cohorts. We're talking right now about screening in people who have had heavy exposure to tobacco for decades, and they're older individuals. That is one of the highest risk cohort one can conveniently define in, in any country in the world, the, the people who have smoked. It's a, an incredible problem. We're going to talk about how we can potentially stop that better, as well as other aspects of that issue. Then we move into the technical session. And that conversation uh, has been titled, and this is clearly a title created by a committee, Harnessing Photon Counting CT and AI in Pre-Competitive Quantitative Consortium for Sustained Public Health Application. So we like simple, you know, characterizations. Um, and um, that will be led by Rick and Raul. And uh, despite its somewhat unwieldy title, there's some very important things that will be discussed. So we're in a, in a critical time, uh, as I just stated, about transitioning to population health. And so population health, actually to you know, certain people means 
we're figuring out a way to push risk off to other people so that we don't have to pay the cost of that. That's kind of, you know, the insider cynical view of population health. But we have another take on this population health, and that prism is the fact that we're no longer going to be doing disease-oriented counting, and so we don't care how many of this procedure you did or how many of that procedure you did. Population health is about the health of the individuals and their outcomes within that population. So it's about actually people getting better, people staying healthy. And so it's, it's a bridge from disease care to health care. And that's profoundly important, especially for the people that think about prevention. Because we want to preempt the end stage of symptomatic lethal disease by understanding the natural history and intervening at strategic points where benefit is still possible. And we'll be talking about that in detail. So we've already talked about the implications of the transition in the funding process. And um, this evolution to population health is kind of an interesting one. This was trumpeted, you know, Bruce Pianson's in the audience. He'll be leading these discussions about this. This is something that people have been talking about for a couple of decades. And it's about to happen for a couple of decades. And maybe it's about to happen really now. And, and we should be prepared. We want to be Wayne Gretzky. We want to be where the puck is and understand where we should be building our focus, our infrastructure and whatnot to actually be where things are going in terms of healthcare delivery, as opposed to how things have been for the last 20 or 30 years. Now, this is complicated. So, you know, we got to ask fundamental questions like, how do we know if we're winning? Because it, it, it turns out how you measure progress, how you measure your metrics profoundly affects a lot of different things. So you got to decide what you're going to score, and we're going to hear about that in very thoughtful ways. And what are the possibilities of creating a metric that drives progress, that drives health, as opposed to is a reactionary kind of, 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 of incentive? And let's get an example of that. So right now, I could ask anybody in the room, what's, what's the percent of uptake of lung cancer screening in 2022? And I don't know what the number is, but it's going to be small, okay? And so there's a lot of people saying, oh, lung cancer screening, you know, it, it's just never going to happen in, in, in a, any kind of mature way. But if you've been reading the literature the last couple of years, there was a report in 2021 from the uh, ILCAP group that um, led by Raja Flores, in which they said, hey, if we look at SEER data across the country and we look at what would happen if screening were actually happening, it will change two things. It will change the percent of stage one detected cancers in a population, and reciprocally, it will reduce the number of stage fours. And we saw that paper in JAMA Network last year in which they demonstrated that you know, in 2010, 2014, whatever, before screening really was going, this, the distribution of stage one and stage fours were very stable. Then all of a sudden, something happened. Stage one started to climb. Now, it's just a little climb, but it was something. And there was a reciprocal decrease in stage four. And they reported that, and that was the first evidence that if screening is working, what is it going to do? It's going to change the stage distribution. So fast forward, JC um, Journal Thoracic Oncology just a month or so, two ago, um, one, of our, one of our participants in the workshop, uh, Dr. Fachani, published with his group that they looked at four different major health systems and looked at stage one, stage four distribution. And again, rec you know, very recently, they're starting to see a change, stage one climbing, stage four decreasing. So if you look for what would happen if screening were starting to be implemented, you'd find that. And it never happened before. <laughs> that is the first glimmer of progress in national implementation of screening. That's 
a metric that maybe we need to look at more carefully. And we'll hear more about that from Bruce. Okay, so this is a slide from uh, the overview from last year. It uh, was talking about a recent publication from IALCAP looking at uh, reanalysis of their 52,000 patients, uh, screening subjects, I'm sorry, and uh, was noting that there was a high distribution of, of undiagnosed, previously unsuspected emphysema in that population. And, and that was in fact published and it was confirmed again by Dr. Pinsky and uh, Dr. Gerarda from the NLST experience in the, in the intervening year. And we now have confidence and feedback from all over the world that this is true. And so this is additional medical information extracted from a thoracic image in this high-risk population. So the question becomes, what do we do about it? You know, and, and we're going to talk about that when we have uh, Dr. Rizzo and, and, and um, uh, um, Javier Zalueta and, and George Wasco are going to lead a discussion about that. I won't get into it, but it's a very important use case for the impact of imaging in a high-risk population. And how we deal with it shouldn't just be about COPD because that's not the last additional information we're going to get from these studies. It's about the process of how do we extract that information, understand the robustness of the information, and start thinking about validating that, and what's of value to bring back into some kind of interventional role within that um, population health management paradigm. So um, that process sounds simple but isn't. And so getting more traction in being able to do that, and to be able to do that in a systematic way is going to be very important. Unless we want to invest 19 years of workshops in thinking about the image information yield from just a thoracic CT. This is a slide from the work of ILCAP with Tony Reeves and David and Claudia in terms of the additional information that can be derived from a routine screening thorax CT, looking at thyroid, thymus, liver, lung, heart. This kind of information is going to be routinely available, and we have to figure out if we want to use this information to help these people, because within these organs is a number of very important major chronic diseases that we can become aware of in individuals. These are heterogeneously distributed in these populations through rhyme and reason that we don't yet understand. So this is an important opportunity to do better disease detection. But this also brings us to a different perspective because we're concerned about prevention. We look at the world through the prism of prevention. And we exist in a healthcare system that is disease oriented and looks at the world and looks at reimbursement and looks about funding infrastructure for disease care. So how do we kind of put this together? So to do this, and I, I have the citation, this is from a series of poems from um, the sixth century before the current era um, that looked at yin and yang. And they were thinking about yin and yang within the province of the world of light and the world of dark. The world of light was heaven, the world of dark was the moon. And they're thinking about the interconnectivity of light and dark, good and bad. And this has been a, a school of thought that's persisted for thousands of years now. We are going to bring this to the health paradigm. We think about health is certain things that we understand. And then disease right now is in a different universe, but we want to bring it together because health and disease are actually a, a incredibly important interconnecting and counterbalancing elements within people. And so the idea that, you know, disease is what we focus on is a problem. Because while we're treating that disease, that individual is still breathing and still ambulating and still functioning, and there's lots of other normal things going on. So we have to understand this dialogue. Now, why does that matter 
within the context of this workshop? Well, because I just showed you this slide, and you can detect all these diseases. But at the same time, you can detect, and screening is going to be done potentially on 15 million high-risk individuals. You're going to be visualizing all the normal structures in those people at the same time. The lung function, the lung structure, the cardiac anatomy, all kinds of other normal structures, such that we can start building composite models of what a healthy individual should look like. And the ability to discern health is something that is kind of missed in our current health care. We want people to be healthy, but we measure disease. If we want to get what we measure, maybe we should measure health. We can measure health in all kinds of ways, and we're going to have a session in which Dr. Yankelovitz and others will be talking about the opportunity to now see normal bone density, normal bone structure, all this other kind of information on a routine annual CT, and start putting that together in such a way that we understand both dimensions of health and disease for an individuals in such ways that we can, we can recruit the ability to enhance health to diminish disease. And that's the essence of what prevention is about. So um, this also was something we talked about last year. This was an effort, and it wound up being a publication, that Rick Avila led between a group of, uh, of, of imaging scientists and, and clinicians that were working with Kiba, Quantitative Imaging Biomarker Alliance, which we've talked about a lot and many of us are involved in. And this was to focus on the use of thoracic CT in early detection of COVID. And there was a paper that was published, and, and the reference is, is cited at the bottom of the slide. Based on conversations last year at this workshop, we talked about, okay, let's take this and move that interface between optimization of quantitative analysis for lung cancer screening and COVID and transfer it from lung cancer screening to lung cancer screening with COPD screening to optimize the acquisition and analysis for both lung cancer and COPD using the same kind of dynamic that led to that first publication. And Rick will be talking about that process and many of the people that are participating in that effort will be involved in the breakout discussions and his sessions, and we look forward to that. So um, we'll conclude the workshop with a breakout uh, discussions. Breakouts, we'll have two different breakouts led by two different teams looking at clinical and technical features. These will be responding to questions, and the whole exercise will be leading towards figuring out action items to move this field further in the coming year. And I think many of you are familiar with this process. And uh, we have a series of questions. You have them in your folder. I'd ask you in your, in your time uh, in between these meetings to think about those questions and think about what would help in your life as you try to apply these tools and how we can talk as a group to come up with solutions that will move the whole field along. So that. We have a final combined breakout group with both groups talking about their solutions, and we try to distill that into action items. This is kind of a, a projected hypothesis from last year's breakouts uh, and the action items, and people can read these and come to their own conclusions about is this still relevant, and is this the most important thing that we should focus on to try to launch the field further in the, in the ensuing year. With that, I will uh, stop, um, and I think we're good on time. If there's any burning questions, um, let's bring them back to the breakout conversations, and right now we'll get ready for our, our next session. Thank you. So because we're doing Zoom stuff, I want to make sure that we stay close to time and we're we're ready for our keynote address. And uh, to do that, we have uh, a wonderful uh, keynote speaker, Daniel C. Daniel C. is um, a colleague that we uh, came to know who leads the development of AI for um, Google and Google Health. 
and he has been involved in a number of activities um, in this sphere. Uh, Daniel got his training in uh, molecular genetics and computer informatics at Ohio State. Uh, he moved on to medical school where he graduated from Dartmouth. He then started to work in the um, computational field in a number of positions, working with uh, very interesting companies like Palantir, where he's involved in developing um, uh, computer systems that are incredibly capable for doing very exciting kind of discovery things for a variety of institutions. He uh, was a medical director at WOTC. For those that of you who are not familiar, that's a not-for-profit on the West Coast that crowdsources uh, the interconnection between people who need health care in the developing world with people who are willing to fund that kind of care from the developed world. And he was uh, instrumental in developing the core infrastructure to allow that to do this very complex mission. And that has evolved in a spectacular way and is now over a, committing over a billion dollars to that kind of activity. And so um, um, Daniel moved initially as a consultant to Google Brain in 2016, but he transitioned to his uh, position as AI product lead uh, in 2017 and has been at Google since and has been involved in some incredibly exciting uh, activities, which he will now tell us about. I won't eat up any more of his time. And so, Daniel, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for the generous introduction. Hopefully you, everyone can hear me. But Sounds great. Present my window here. So let me know if you can see the screen and I'll get started. Can everyone, can people, can people see my screen? Unfortunately, I can't see you all and the, and the screen. Yes, we can see your screen. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Well, again, thank you for all, uh, everyone for having me. It's really exciting to be able to talk to uh, a group of people like yourselves who are passionate about uh, change in the healthcare system. Um, I'll be giving you a talk today on what we have seen here, at least at Google, and in the field generally when it comes to promise, problems, and progress when it comes to AI and medical imaging, as well as AI and healthcare generally. A little bit in the field, a little bit at Google, as well as some work on my team, which will hopefully provide some inspiration as you all break out today and have a lot of really meaningful discussions. And so uh, I think there's probably time for Q&A later, but happy to be stopped at any point as well. So I think you know, these terms are not that uh, important, but it's more just to know that there are many, that artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning have been pursuits for many years. Uh, and actually one that has been pursued across many fields as well, computer science, mathematics, statistics, you know, the, the more traditional sciences and things like that. However, I think uh, these are kind of from a computer science perspective, at least, you know, what we'll be focusing on is the evolution of these ideas uh, throughout time. And there's going to be three major buckets of things to think about. Uh, the three major areas in which have contributed the most to the progression of this field have been the architecture, compute, and data. Uh, but really what it comes down to is building models and building infrastructure that can help computer programs teach themselves things, which turns out is a very powerful concept. And so we'll be going through a lot of different discussions of progressions in various fields. However, I think I wanna call attention to this again and underscore that for the most part, whenever you see a step forward in one of these areas, typically AI does move forward. And when you start to see steps forward in multiple areas, then things start to get really exciting. For the most part today, we'll be focusing on the data sets as well as the compute. Uh, and maybe touch a little bit on the architecture maturation over time as well. And so, you know, what is deep learning? Uh, deep learning is not a new concept, as I've said before. In many ways, what has been the most promising, even though these ideas have been around for many years, is that uh, over time, you know, as I was talking about those three variables, uh, data size, model size, and compute have advanced significantly over the past 20 to 30 to 40 years. 
And so with these older techniques that didn't advance, uh, say in architecture, um, weren't able to leverage some of these other things I was talking about, like data and compute. But the exciting part is these new architectures that we've been working on uh, and applying uh, to some of those uh, compute architectures as well as data sets have been very, very exciting. And we'll talk a lot about that today and its progression through Google and its progression through our exploration of the medical imaging field here at Google. I do wanna take a step back and I think it does help to look through history as you can begin to see the patterns and trends of how AI has evolved over time. And probably the, one of the most seminal moments in this particular field started a little over 10 years ago, uh, centered around a project at Stanford called ImageNet. And ImageNet is kind of like a Olympics or Super Bowl for computer imaging and computer vision. Basically, it's a, there was a large data set and there's a, a rough competition basically to see who could create the best models that could take images that had never been seen before by that model and identify them uh, correctly with the correct label. And so for many years, this, this idea and this competition went on and this is something that took all comers. And so you get lots of different models and lots of different ideas from all over the world. Um, you know, if you're a really uh, good model, what you do is you take in these images that you've never seen and you generate a set of labels uh, and you, you kind of give them, the model would output its top five labels per image. And if you're really good, a little over 10 years ago, you might get two out of four of these correct. So around 50% accuracy. And so the really exciting thing happened when all of a sudden um, there was a model out of the blue in 2011 uh, that suddenly increased that threshold uh, where everyone was around 50% to 75% accuracy. And this turns out to be the first modern instantiation of a deep neural network. Uh, as you can see, every year since, um, that amount of accuracy has increased significantly. And actually every year since, it has been a deep learning model that has won this particular competition. I think the most notable thing is that actually starting in 2015, these models started surpassing human ability uh, in terms of accuracy as well. And, and ever since then, it's just been going up and to the right. Obviously, there's a lot of excitement around this when you can get a model to see uh, so accurately. Um, there's a lot of applications people begin to explore. And so uh, many research institutions, uh, as you can see here, started around that time, the explosion in publications around this type of work uh, is, is pretty evident. And you can see that uh, it's pretty much exponentially up and to the right and uh, actually surpassing uh, Moore's law in terms of growth. And so uh, within Google as well, the same kind of excitement gathered. First, taking these core concepts of deep neural networks and then applying them first to applications that you all might use like Gmail, Google Maps, Photos, and things like that. Uh, and basically started being applied across Google uh, similarly at an exponential rate. Oh, it's not advancing, here we go. And so it started then to percolate into a lot of products and in many places you may not even under know that AI is being used. Um, some of the prominent uses that uh, are in things like Google Photos for computer vision where you no longer have to tag your photos. If you remember back in the day, having to manually tag your photos if you were as organized as me, I used to do this, but now I don't have to, it'll just automatically search. And actually a product that I use quite a bit because I travel uh, a lot, and I have food allergies, is checking food allergies on menus and food allergies on the backs of uh, food packaging. And so this is one of my favorite combination of using text uh, AI translation as well as live video uh, translation to take and replace those images. And so, you know, after a couple of years of doing this, three, four, five years of taking these modern networks and applying them uh, to a lot of the problems that we saw in our core products, there was a, a call uh, around 2015 to basically try and apply these models to as many new applications as possible because we were hitting the ceiling on applications internally. And the thought and the hypothesis was that if you could apply these machine learning models to new domains, it would actually feed back and you would learn a lot more and be able to progress the field forward even faster. And so we started investing this AI and things like our self-driving initiatives, a whole host of other things like uh, art, music, robotics, security, and many more. And it has actually helped form this unit that I'm now a part of uh, called Google AI that I'm fortunate to be a part of. And so around this time too, 2015, 2016, uh, there was a decision to begin looking at 
the field of medicine and seeing where we might be able to contribute uh, to that, bringing you know, our compute and our learnings from AI uh, to medical imaging, medical text, medical audio, as many different types of signals as you can think of. And so the team that formed around this, uh, looking at all these different domains, is just a group of people like myself, scientists, programmers, product managers, designers, and more. And we're fortunate enough to get to build new AI, mo new AI models and apply them to new industries all the time. And so one of the major areas that we focus on, because especially these new algorithms were so exquisitely good at seeing, uh, was the field of, of machine vision. And so very loosely speaking, there are three types of tasks when it, you're making a model C. You can classify things, you know, what is this thing? You can localize things. Where is this thing in the photo? Or you can summarize things like what's going on generally in this photo as well. As you all know uh, from working in this field, those translate quite well uh, to a number of domains in medical imaging. So whether it's classification, you're trying to figure out if a mole looks benign or malignant, localization, if you're looking at a lot of digital pathology slides and you want to find that needle in the haystack, or you're looking at uh, the area where you all are an expert and looking at radiological images and summarizing the, the total amount of pathology or other issues that are going on there. And so I'm going to talk through two examples today. Uh, the first will be in ophthalmology, the second in digital pathology. Since I know you all are experts in, in the field of uh, uh, radiology, I'm not going to comment too much on that, mostly to look at these other fields and potentially help open your minds and inspire you to think about how there might be cross applications. And so, you know, the, the formation of the team, as I talked about earlier, uh, actually happened as what's called a 20% project at Google. And for those of you who don't know what a 20% project is, basically one day a week or the equivalent of one day a week at Google, uh, you are able to do whatever you want uh, as long as you're getting the rest of your job done. And so this has been a early cultural part of Google and has actually inspired many important things. Products like Gmail and Google Maps came out of these side projects that people were working on. And so around the time there was that call at Google to begin looking as wide as possible for new applications of machine learning in new domains outside of Google's core products, there were a group of people who worked on image search and Google Photos, uh, so clearly in the machine vision or computer vision space, who wanted to do a 20% project. Uh, a couple engineers from India, and they went home uh, to their hometown and saw actually this queue. And it turns out this is at a very prominent eye hospital in India. And so they weren't really sure uh, exactly what was going on. And so went to the front of the line and were told basically it's a long queue for getting your eyes checked for any signs of uh, diabetes related damage uh, to your vision. And so, you know, they looked inside and they basically were like, okay, what's going on here? Uh, why is there a long queue? Turns out there's a huge, huge shortage of doctors uh, in India. Uh, these numbers are actually low. It's actually increased uh, since we last uh, kind of looked into this. But uh, the tragic thing is that lack of those lack of eye doctors, eye specialists, and technicians results in almost half of all patients in India suffering vision loss before any kind of diagnosis is made. Uh, given, as we all know, the increase in uh, diseases like diabetes, I think this is only likely to increase. And so, you know, thinking through this, you know, knowing that they had this great expertise in computer vision, seeing that in many ways, this is a computer vision problem as we're about to talk about, they were like, hey, maybe this is a problem that could be solved by applying that technology that we've done on these other products into this field. And so they started looking into this and I'm sure many of you are already well aware of these things, but I'll just review it really fast. But, you know, what they saw inside of that clinic was a technician, this machine that takes a photo of the back of your eye or a fundus photograph. And so um, what is done then, you know, they did a lot more research into this, is that these images, similar to your field, uh, are graded uh, with a certain type of scale uh, for diabetic retinopathy, uh, usually a five-point scale. And so it's assessed uh, basically a healthy eye versus diseased eye, and they are referred to more advanced care or referred for follow-up uh, based on what they see there and the disease progression there. And so... Obviously, there's everything from healthy on one end to proliferative diabetic retinopathy on the much more unfortunate side of things. And so they wanted to get a sense of, okay, is it just a problem of access or are there other problems as well? And so we ran a study internally 
as part of this 20% project. And this is what we call the rainbow diagram. Um, basically, what is demonstrated here is that uh, each uh, column is a uh, ophthalmologist. Uh, and then each row is actually one case. And as you can see here, uh, as in many fields, um, when it's really obvious, I think there's a lot of consensus outside of maybe uh, the, this poor person over here. Uh, but really, the big problem is when the cases are in the middle, there's a lot of variability. And so we ran a reader study and found some very interesting results. I think first, that uh, readers do not agree with them, each other about two thirds of the time. But then when you give someone a case, you give them a washout period of say a month or so, they actually don't even agree with themselves two thirds of the time. And so for these kinds of things, uh, the team was convinced that this was worth investing in. Um, so kind of in a nights and weekends type project, uh, they started working on this. Uh, they wanted to be able to find algorithms that could help both with the access problem and uh, the accuracy problem that we were seeing. And so, you know, what do you do from an ML perspective? And again, many of you folks may know this already, but I'll just walk through it. You know, you basically get as many images as you can, uh, given the integrator variability and intragrader variability that we were seeing, you get as many specialists as you can, and then you get them to label those images uh, as, as much as possible. And in this case, actually, we were labeling these images almost nine to 10 times per uh, image. So nine ophthalmologists, nine to 10 ophthalmologists per image so that we could get to some kind of consensus on the data. And it's really important because it'll help you in building a robust architecture uh, during that training phase. And so, you know, how do you do this and how do you structure this really valuable data that you've gathered? You use most of it to train the algorithm or like giving it the homework to learn over time. Uh, then you've got a small portion as well for the tuning, which is like the midterms. And then eventually you do need to give it a final exam. And so fortunately in the field of ophthalmology, there's a couple well-respected data sets that have been vetted by experts. And so the team was able to come together and then test uh, the model against those things. And so the team continued forward and built a tool like you can see here where you can upload a fundus photograph and it'll provide and spit out for you like in, on that five point scale along with a couple other more operational details um, what it thinks the image is. And so the team then, you know, very excited by some of the results, uh, published the paper, uh, published a paper, sorry, in uh, the uh, in JAMA at the end of 2016. Uh, and what we were able to show is that the model itself was on par or better than sort of the general ophthalmologist. And so what I'm going to walk through next is kind of the, the general progression of research that we've gone through at Google. You know, once we see that there's a possibility for uh, some interesting scientific and clinical research advances, uh, then you obviously don't stop there. One dimension of research that you can go under is improving the model. So a couple of years later, the team was able to improve the models using updated architecture, more data, as I was talking about earlier, and obviously more compute too, and able to get the model to the level of retinal specialists uh, and far beyond generalists. You know, in many ways, too, another vein of research is better understanding exactly how these models are seeing things because uh, they may not view things in the same way uh, as we do. And so looking at the interpretability or understanding the visualization of what the model is looking at is a big field of study as well. And so we apply these concepts uh, to this type of work, too. So what am I talking about exactly? You know, when let's say we're looking, building a dog species identification model you want to understand is it accurately looking at the right thing or is it just like randomly looking at noise or random things when it makes this prediction and you hope there's at least some sense in what it's looking at and so in these cases here on the left hand side the heat map shows that when it's making prediction for the the pomeranian here on the left hand side that it's looking at the face and then you want to also make sure that when it's looking at images that it could confuse with humans or other things in the background that it is paying more attention to the right thing. And on the right hand side here with the Afghan hound, it's focusing on the dog and avoiding any kind of uh, association with the uh, humans as well. And so how does this look when you apply it to the field of medical imaging? You know, first thing is you take a look at images like this. Uh, this is just some, some details on the types of, of images. And we had uh, 
a number of folks adjudicate these images to make sure. And so this is kind of another type of uh, qualitative study we would do. And so then you overlay the heat map to see where it's looking. And fortunately, it does actually, when you take a look and, and, and meet with these retinal specialists, it does seem to be looking at these various damages to the vessels and mild uh, DR. And then you continue forward as well to take a look at, okay, for maybe a more advanced case, you're hoping there's more damage, at least that the model is finding in this particular image. And indeed, that that's the case, you're seeing a lot more, uh, it's pointing out a lot of the hemorrhaging and some of these other uh, areas of damage uh, around the periphery as well. So we talked a little bit about, obviously, increasing the horsepower of a model. We talked a little bit about understanding how the model is seeing things or thinking about things. Uh, what are some other areas? I think some very exciting things that we discovered early on a number of years ago is that, okay, now we've got a bunch of this data. We've got a lot of associated case data for the patients. Like what else, what are the kinds of correlations can we potentially find? Turns out actually there's some new signals that weren't known before that you could gather from these fundus images. So for example, it turns out you can actually look at the refractive error or how bad someone's vision is just from their fundus image. And it's really interesting to think about this because doctors and specialists and technicians have been looking at these images for many years and never were able to make that kind of an association. But fortunately, you know, whether it's UK Biobank or some of these other groups have put out data uh, that allows uh, groups to look for these kind of novel signals. Probably the most exciting thing is actually taking a look at some of these other uh, really important clinical measures. And it turns out actually from these funded images as well, there's, a, there's ways of predicting things like age, gender, hemoglobin A1C, and blood pressure. Uh, and especially because of the way that these fundus images are captured, it really opens up a lot of interesting possibilities for non-invasive ways of getting at things like cardiovascular risk and uh, other things like that. And that's an area that we're continuing to explore to this day. We think this could access, help open up a lot of access to new points of care and new types of care as well. And so uh, we won't talk too much at this particular time, but obviously, in the field of medical devices, uh, which we're talking about now, it's really important to think about clinical trials and regulatory. And those are all things that we're engaged in at this moment. In fact, we do have a CE mark uh, for some of this work already and a number of things uh, in review. So the next thing I'm gonna jump to really briefly is at least just another field in the medical imaging world. And so for this one, I'll talk a little bit about digital pathology. Um, and talk about some of the challenges that you can see across different different imaging types. And so we've got, you know, really small images, relatively speaking, maybe five to ten megabytes in fundus images. And, and we'll see here in digital pathology, it's, it's a whole different beast. So similar to our exploration around the same time, a little bit after that early work in ophthalmology, the team started getting excited and started exploring a lot of other fields, including digital pathology, radiology, dermatology, and, and many others. Um, but as you can imagine, a similar tale can be told for the diabetic ret retinopathy screening. Uh, as with looking at digital pathology images, we happened to look at breast cancer metastases because uh, there were some open challenges and some open data sets at the time. And so we quickly grew to learn uh, that there are some unique uh, issues and in infrastructure you have to deal with when looking at this data. Uh, compared before, as I was saying, with the five megabyte, um, 10 megabyte fundus images, we're looking at gigapixel images, which are like gigabyte size files. Uh, and you know, when you are looking at these large images, 100,000 by 100,000 pixels, and you're looking for something really small in that image, it does pose a very large and interesting challenge. And again, this is the kind of thing that gets our engineers really excited because it's new, it pushes our ability and it pushes our model architectures and our infrastructure uh, to new places. And hopefully that allows us to put that information out of the world to help the field as a whole. And so, uh, as I was saying before, very similar story, uh, a lot of uh, inter and intra greater variability. And so that at many times when we see problems like that, we, we feel strongly that there's ways that we can build models and tools that can help uh, physicians in being uh, and performing it at the highest level and most consistent level possible. And so how do you then think, okay, after the first project, like, okay, there's lots of probably things we can do in the short term and the long term. And so I'll walk through at least one of these cases about how we uh, worked on this particular problem early on. But similar to the work that I talked about in ophthalmology, there's a whole host of types of research. Once you can get a model to understand that type of data, 
uh, there are so many possibilities for what you can do if you have associated data, both in the short term and the long term. So I'll just briefly run through this. As I've alluded to before, this is very much a needle in a haystack problem. Um, you know, whereas before you were looking at these regions that might constitute uh, a larger percentage of that photograph, when you have to look and the, the model has to find something really so small, it was actually an unknown problem at the time if, if the models could see at that resolution, so to speak. And so this kind of illustrates crudely, at least, uh, what the problem looks like for a machine. Obviously, this is a problem that pathologists have been dealing with for a long period of time. Um, but in many ways, uh, humans are very good at this kind of thing. And, and really, it was an open question whether uh, we can get a model to, to look at, at this kind of fine detail. And so, you know, why are these things hard beyond just needle and haystack? Obviously, things look very similar. And that's why folks like yourselves go to school for so long and train with the best of the best is that you to build this sense ability of what is true signal versus not. Um, and similarly, this is an open question at the time, whether you could build models that could faithfully do this kind of thing. In addition to needle in the haystack, things that look really similar, the context was another question too, looking at multiple zoom levels. Uh, maybe in your field, it's looking at multiple levels and, and zoom levels of a stack of images. In the digital pathology world as well, maybe not as many slices, uh, but they do have images and they need to understand context at multiple different uh, levels of, of scale. And so this is another issue and an open question as well. And so we started doing a similar type of study, another kind of 20% project on this team at the time. And so what you'll see here on the top is, a, is one case and the, 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 the bottom row is another case. And basically there's the biopsy image uh, that's taken by a digital pathology scanner. And then we uh, worked with a bunch of pathologists to label the ground truth of what was actually tumor versus not, or, or problem areas versus not. And you can see here, there's two types of cases. On the top, there's one where there's lots uh, of problematic areas. And then similar uh, to what I was talking about earlier, there's this, on this whole slide, there's this very small area on the bottom uh, left here. And so we wanted to take a look and see if the models could distinguish between the two. We actually found out something really interesting, which we might be able to talk about later, is that we then first actually just basically took a model out the box, which is, a model that was not trained significantly on medical imaging before. And what was exciting is actually you see that it does, you know, while it's not very specific, it does pick up all the areas that you would hope for uh, in this, this deep red area. And then down here on the left, on the bottom row, it uh, picks out there. Obviously it picks up a whole bunch of other things, but what's interesting is that the model that we worked with was not trained on medical imaging. It was just trained on general purpose images. And it already has a rough sensibility and it can see at a crude level what is going on here. And then with additional refinement, uh, we were able to get it a lot more specific. And so along the same lines, we threw these same cases at the model after the refinements. And you can see from those heat maps kind of combining that uh, work I was talking about earlier around visualization and attention of those models is able to distinguish signal versus noise. And then you can just set thresholds about what you're kind of ruling in or ruling out as a problem area. Uh, it can find that needle in the haystack as well, which is very exciting. And then it also can uh, distinguish between things that often mimic each other as well. And so we published this work uh, as well, and we've advanced a lot, uh, which if we have time, I can answer questions on that too, uh, both on the modeling side and because of those large scale images, like I was talking about on the infrastructure side too. So I'm not gonna belabor every single area that we work on. Uh, we have a large set of efforts in the general radiology space um, digital pathology, I just walked through, dermatology, genomics, many other fields as well. But it kind of all follows the same pattern for this style of project. There's an AI vision challenge, a unique one, and we want to extend our models and infrastructure, uh, both within Google and the, you know, as the community develops these ideas as a whole. Then we do a proof of concept. Then we expand our research in a whole host of different places, like the, um, the correlation research I was talking about, the visualization research, we do that across the board. And then we think a lot about how do we either enable or ourselves go through productionization in GTM. And as you can see here on the far right hand side, there's uh, a lot of interesting areas of exploration that we have for the future too. So I know this group is very uh, keenly interested in population health. So I did wanna speak to that as well and some of the work that our team has been focusing on here. And so 
you know, we've looked a little bit here in the first two cases at what it looks like for individual patients and maybe the quote unquote normal clinical workflow. Um, we actually began looking into this and have kind of skirted around the edges and tried things for a long period of time, but it really came into large focus for us uh, over the past three years uh, during COVID. And so, you know, early on, Google wanted to find ways of contributing to this. And so uh, we obviously have unique access to data. Um, and so we started brainstorming as many different ways as possible of trying to contribute to the early efforts in COVID from our perspective. We obviously don't, we're not a hospital, we're not healthcare providers, but we do have is a lot of uh, interesting data sets and interesting perspectives on things. And so one of the projects that came out of the early parts of COVID was a call from a lot of public health agencies around the world, better understanding how uh, lockdown and quarantine uh, rules were going so that they could plan ahead uh, for different types of events. And so uh, when we did that, we kind of racked our brains and started to find ways of doing privacy aware aggregation of data where we could give these public health agencies a uh, sense of what in a various resolutions, like how populations are moving around the density of, of aggregation of people as well, so that they could begin to um, plan for the future. And this is actually something we just, we recently turned down, but was running for two years and we were still putting out to a lot of these agencies around the world. And so this was a, this is one option. And so after this was an initial, we got feedback from a lot of these groups that this is really important. We expanded to a lot of other things as well. And so whether it was the community mobility reports here on the left, we started working with ad agent, uh, started working with um, uh, agencies like the WHO and others to try and put forward the information that they thought was important to get out to the public. Obviously, we know a lot of people come to Google, and especially if they're searching for things like COVID, uh, we wanted to surface that information, uh, that kind of authoritative information. We added things like symptom search data sets to help public health researchers, vaccination access data sets, both to help with planning, uh, as well as uh, uh, consumers trying to get access to these vaccinations, and then also providing that same type of information back to the community for research as well. And so this inspired a lot of really interesting work to begin thinking in a much more creative way about the types of data and the types of partnerships that you could do to get that data to think about you know, people's health holistically and people's well being holistically. And so on the left hand side here, we started expanding to adding air sensor networks, which we know um, contribute a lot. Pollution and other things like that contribute quite a bit uh, to people's health. And so whether it was adding new sensor networks that we bring data in for, we actually add, started adding these sensors on top of our street view, Google street view cars so that we can get live updates uh, as these cars are driving around and uh, started partnering and then eventually acquiring this, this company Rizometer that brings in things like air pollution, pollen, wildfire and weather data to begin adding more complex modeling. And then using all that data, we started prototyping new novel tools, whether it's flood forecasting or fire uh, prediction or fire, uh, wildfire, like, uh, like boundary capturing and things like that. And then really taking those signals uh, where, the, where they end up being the most helpful and applying those to our, the tools that people use every day, whether it's Google Maps, surfacing them on Nest Hubs or making them available through other APIs as well. And so while this type of data or this type of uh, problem may not be as relevant to your field in a day-to-day -day sense, I think we have learned quite a bit uh, when it comes to population health and we are engaged in a lot of projects right now. I think it's really important and we had to push ourselves even to think about finding new data sets to integrate in with the data sets that we know really well and finding new partnerships as well because uh, health happens in, in a lot of different contexts and not just necessarily uh, in, in the ones that we think of all the time. Um, we developed a lot of new methods for rapidly prototyping new models and tools to see where there's signal versus noise and just opportunity, and then integrating those into workflows as quickly as possible so you can get feedback as well. The last thing I'll touch on uh, is taking a look at the evolution of compute and infrastructure over the time um, that there's been this boom in renaissance and AI. And so this is a graph that comes from a group called OpenAI, who focuses and does some of the best AI in the world. And that first model I was talking about way back at the beginning of the talk, that was focused on that ImageNet challenge, that one that basically kind of blew the doors off of everyone else that one year, and then kind of replaced everyone's approach uh, going forward for the future is down here and to the left. And as you can see from that particular model to even two, three years ago, there's been a 300,000 uh, X increase in the compute 
that is both available and used for a lot of the models these days. And so, as I was saying before, there's architecture, uh, there's data and compute, and obviously compute has uh, increased significantly. What does that look like exactly? I think for yours, those of you who don't know, this is a GPU. Uh, traditionally, it was built for the gaming industry because it turns out um, what is used to calculate things to produce really great looking computer graphics and responsive computer graphics are the same types of calculations that can be used uh, in parallel for uh, machine learning. And so the advance of GPUs and explosion of resources and investment in this has just allowed so many more possibilities in terms of architecture for AI. Uh, Google, Apple, all the companies are now developing their own custom uh, units are like even more specialized to various types of ML operations. And this is also in, allowed for even more opportunities uh, for types of training as well as deployment of models as well. And so this all happens in the cloud, but obviously a lot of life does not happen in the cloud. And so in addition to this, uh, ourselves and a lot of companies are developing what are called edge um, compute devices. So making sure on your phone, making sure uh, out where there's low internet connectivity that you can also do this kind of work uh, very efficiently. And this graph basically, or this uh, table basically shows the efficiencies that you get when you have a customized device for machine learning versus a general purpose device like a CPU that have driven our computers for, for most of the last 30 years. But, you know, for these specialized types of tasks, actually these are amazing and really important too to think about for the types of surfaces where you can deploy AI to have an impact on patients' lives. And so just to give you a sense, you know, these things can run real time, no internet connectivity, and you can even build chips nowadays specifically for specific models. And so if you have a very important application, then you can use it or customize silicon for that too. Um, this is not really an advertisement much to show that this has become more and more affordable. I actually had to update this slide because most of these prices have decreased by like 20 to 30% uh, since the last time I checked. And so, this is becoming increasingly cheaper and hopefully makes it more accessible to more folks too. Um, how do you think about, okay, you got all this compute, you got all this data, but you've got to put it together on top of a infrastructure stack. And so I'm going to really briefly run through uh, what this looks like for us. So this is kind of a, a rough schematic of what research and deploy uh, R and D infrastructure might look like, you know, in addition to just the training, I think there's a lot to think about, whether it's the data acquisition and the labeling, as we've talked about a little bit. But in particular, a lot of folks don't think too much about how you run your experiments so that you can get the best hypotheses to test, as well as how do you deploy these things over time, too. And so this is R&D architecture, but you know, what if you want to run in production? You know, then there's even more capabilities and things that you have to think about. You know, we've talked a little bit here on the left-hand side about edge computing, storage, and running all these things in the cloud as well, where it's increasingly becoming uh, much more flexible and powerful to do this kind of work. We don't have a ton of time, unfortunately, today, but beyond just the raw horsepower and compute in the models, there's so much more that goes into a model that is used and has a positive impact on people, whether it is understanding users' needs, thinking about explainability and trust, as we've touched on a little bit, the feedbacks and controls, and you know, models are not perfect, so making sure that they fail gracefully is really important as well. So I'll end off with sort of talking about where we are, you know, how I, I view kind of the state of the world and, and what I think is really exciting for the future. You know, so what is AI really good at? I think we've known that it's really good at helping experts like yourselves ask better questions and get better and more specific answers, especially on new types of data uh, that we weren't able to do before. You know, when you've locked in a really good model or a good way of doing things with a the model, then it does help with automation and scaling. And then especially as you're seeing more recently with these new generative models that AI is really getting really quite good at facilitating interaction and creation too. And so these are kind of potentially, you know, how does it work today? These models as I've talked about are mostly in the supervised learning realm. Um, they mostly are task specific. So, you know, we have a model for each thing. We have a model for retinal disease. We have a model for lung disease. We have a model for X, Y, and Z. And so while there is some use of transfer learning, um, which is basically building a model, getting it 90% of the way there, and then allowing it to, to transfer to new tasks in the same domain. Uh, it's still not uh, as much as we would like. And so multitask learning is the thing where you have one model that can do multiple things at the same time. Uh, it tends to be more efficient, but that's not the, the state of the art has not really been pushed in that direction too much yet. 
And so that naturally lends itself to problems. So there's over specialization to one task. It, generally, we still think of these models as, as having one type of data input, which does limit the kind of impact that it can have. And then the other problem more from a compute perspective is that you have to like activate that whole model. These can be expensive to run. And so we think these problems naturally kind of will, will bring in and usher in the next cycle of innovation because we think we'll be able to get to true multitask models or models that can do multiple things at the same time, models that can take in uh, truly multiple data sets. You can imagine the power of pathology, population health signals, and uh, medical radiological imaging at the same time. And then hopefully we can get them into an architecture on the right hand side here called sparse models that makes it really ex uh, inexpensive to run as well, which also increases the accessibility. And so uh, I will end it there. I know we've covered a lot. It's been a whirlwind, but I'm happy to go back, double click on things or answer questions to the best of my ability. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel. That was great. Um, lots of stuff to think about. Um, uh, so what we'd like to do now is if there's any questions, uh, if people could come to the microphone and uh, identify yourself and do the questions. Um, while people are thinking about that, Daniel, um, it was really interesting to hear about the data partnerships and, and the open architecture. Uh, I know in your work with Palantir, previously you worked with open source uh, types of approaches to things. And it seems particularly relevant in bringing that into the prevention context because, um, you know, this is an area that has, you know, global implications. And so our challenge is that when you identified the, uh, the example with the uh, retinal imaging, uh, the time from acquiring the imaging, expert review, ground truth is relatively finite. In the system, in the process we're working with with screening, where we're looking on an annual basis at an asymptomatic population, ground truth, you know, in different areas is not going to be available till 10 years out, 15 years out, multiple annual imaging and stuff like that and an aggregation of data, but we have this time lag. And so, in a sense, we don't want everybody in the world creating their own little solution. We want to take this large data that we acquire over time and try to, to um, leverage it as, as quickly and efficiently as possible for you know, global public health benefit. What kind of experience from what you've talked about could be relevant in bringing forward a cooperative kind of open approach to this kind of particular public health problem? Yeah, it's a great question, I think. Along multiple dimensions, there are, sorry, there's an echo um, Yeah, I think it's a great question. And actually, we've only been able to do this research because we've had collaborations across the area, or we're working with groups who do open source these data sets. I think it does start with inspiration, we found too, is that like a lot of groups happen to um, been collecting this data or we're like working with groups and a lot of other researchers around the world are, are like seeing a research hypothesis. And then what's nice about a lot of this AI research is you can quickly prove or disprove a lot of your hypotheses. And so sometimes the data, you know, people may not be able to mobilize or get the resources to mobilize all their data. You can set a hypothesis, get a small amount, say, hey, we've got great results with this particular set of combinations of data. Will you then, you know, if it goes well, will you then, you know, open source or will you then make available this data for this research project uh, that is even on a grander scale? And so actually a lot of our early work, and we haven't, we didn't talk a lot about our radiology work, but we did exactly that. We would work with a couple of different groups and say, hey, look, we did work with these open source data sets. We think there's something interesting here um, because we see this, this, and this. And then the PIs and the administrators start to get really excited after they after you de-risk things for them a little bit. And that's the power of a lot of this work is that relatively speaking, um, doing those early prototyping things are, are, are quite inexpensive um, relative to running a very large, formal, traditional, like multi-center, multi-site study. And that's how it builds over time. You know, we do run those things now, but it's after we've de-risked at multiple steps. And so um, that's helped a lot. I think what's nice too about this particular AI field, at least, is there is a, a large spirit of open uh 
open release and something that we work on. There's a little bit of a lag because of a lot of the, the, the legal and regulatory reasons, but we do also aim uh, to get a lot of our models and infrastructure out into the world. And, and we do that uh, progressively. In addition, we do quite a bit of funding of these open data sets too, because we know how important they are. And so uh, advocating for that kind of funding and those kind of projects uh, really do yield uh, very unexpected and really cool results. Okay, thank you very much. And this pre-competitive community that we have to develop is a, an incredibly important challenge to come back to in this workshop. Uh, next question, please. Hi, hi, Rick Avila from Acumetra. Um, in 2019, I believe Google AI did publish a paper on uh, some results on lung uh, cancer AI, and we haven't seen anything since. Can you give us an update where it is and where it's going? Yeah, there should be some more updates there soon. Um, we have, hopefully, fingers crossed, a couple more publications coming out, and we are working on some additional partnerships there, and uh, we'll hopefully have more for you there soon. But uh, we do realize it's been a little bit uh, since our last publication, but we are working on both getting that work into the hands of folks in the field, as well as publishing some new results that we've been working on more recently. Uh, Dan, uh, Bruce Pyanson from Milliman. Uh, thank you for the whirlwind tour. Uh, uh, question I, I have is about uh, the, the prominence of Watson Health in the oncology space, and I know uh, you might be reluctant to talk about a competitor, or, or perhaps not, but what happened there? There was um, certainly a lot of uh, uh, publicity and a lot of, of excitement around that. But I'd be very curious with your, your view. Was it too early? Was it misguided? Was it what, what, what your thoughts are? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I don't know a lot of folks over there uh, that well, so I, I can't speak authoritatively on the, the topic. But I will say, you know, the first wave of a lot of these things is kind of why, you know, I talked a little bit about the promise is always the same. It's like we hope that, you know, these technologies, whether it's AI or others, are just going to come in and, and revolutionize things. Um, and oftentimes uh, that's where a lot of the hype comes from. And that's a really important part of the process is getting things going. However, the really hard and dirty work is figuring out what works and what doesn't, bringing people along with the process. Uh, and that does take many years. And so I think something we've learned a lot from is to try and be as uh, measured in things over time uh, so that we can make sure that we are slow in our progress, that we publish on these things to get feedback on things uh, before we kind of invest a lot, so to speak, in the marketing. But, you know, Watson, I don't know, again, know much, but they did publish a lot of early work. Um, and then uh, something that we learned too is that you gotta keep publishing, kind of keep getting that feedback from the scientific and clinical community. And so I think in many ways, I, there's this, this law called Amara's law, you can look up and I'm probably gonna butcher it, but uh, in, in many ways, I think it was like the, it's the world kind of under, uh, it overestimates the impact of technology in the short run and underestimates it in the long run. And I think a lot of that important work happens in the, in the in between to make sure things are safe, make sure things that uh, there's a, a plausible business model for these kinds of things. And we've learned a lot from uh, our own mistakes, uh, from a lot of other uh, kind of the path of a lot of other groups in the industry as well. But unfortunately, I don't know a ton of details about exactly what happened at Watson, but that's just my observation. OK, thank you. We have one more question, then we have a couple of questions in the chat. Okay, David Jankelovitz from Mount Sinai uh, in New York City. Uh, I have a question regarding um, your uh, retinal scan. Uh, and just as a model, for example, how do you, you guys built the software that does the interpretation, but how do you, A, go about sort of commercializing this? Do you choose partners? Does Google commercialize it? And secondly, uh, it's out there now. People are using it. You go to any eye doctor's office there, they're getting a read on it. Do you continue to collect data in some way? Uh, and use that to further update your models? How, how does that whole process work? Yeah, a couple yeah. of great questions in there. I think first, uh, we work with partners. I think in many ways, Google, I mean, we are still uh, an information organization company. And the types of work we do is trying to make 
that information more useful generally, as well as advancing these technologies that can help us in the future. So we partner heavily in this field because this is not necessarily the, the day-to-day type of thing that we do is like clinical care at all. And so, you know, what we think we can contribute is creating an imagination for what's possible given the infrastructure that we have, the you know, smart people we have to think of new ways of using these computer architectures and things like that. But really a lot of what we want to do is, is push the field forward generally from the technological perspective and then put the technology or the ideas that we have in the hands of people generally or uh, giving that, that, uh, those types of assets to people who can have the boots on the ground, so to speak. And so we partner heavily for a lot of those things. Um, there are areas where you know, we think there are unique opportunities for us to help fund you know, limited uh, showcases or places where we think that the market is not uh, addressing an exquisite need. And so there we will invest uh, for impact. But in many ways, our first thought is around partnerships. And I'm sorry, I think I might have missed the second part of your question. How do you use data that continues to come in to still update your models? Yeah. yeah. So a lot of it just comes down. To, oh, sorry, it's mute. Uh, there's a lot of it just comes down to the uh, the individual contract. So in many places there where we're just kind of putting the model out of the field, we do not get data back. Um, when we see that there's a potential problem or potential area where we can improve something, then we will go out and sign a, a contract with a particular group to collect data under an IRB or other, you know, some other mechanism like that, so that we can run a study, uh, understand the results, and then Im improve things from there. And so a lot of it just is a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. Uh, Dan, we have a question uh, through the chat. Uh, where is ARDA currently deployed? Are the requirements of the clinics in India similar to that in the EU and US? And um, how do you address those kinds of, of regulatory international issues? Yeah, it's a, a big question, an important one. Uh, we currently are deployed in a lot of areas around the world. We have a CE mark. Uh, we are deployed in India, in Thailand. Uh, and working with a lot of partners there and actually working to get our technology in the hands of various partners there as well. Um, the second question is the much more complicated one, but basically every country, for now at least, has a different interpretation and a different set of rules around these things. So the way we work on it here is in addition to folks like myself, I'm a product manager, uh, we have a huge team of regulatory experts, lawyers, we have local counsel, and so for each deployment, we do an evaluation at a country level and then at a site level as well about how these rules uh, are interpreted and how it's best uh, to be you know, assessed under these various types of uh, regulatory groups and things like that. And so it's different in India, it's different in Thailand, it's different in Germany, just kind of like you know, throwing things like that. And so we spend a lot of time both meeting with these regulatory groups uh, understand how they think about AI, trying to influence them with the knowledge that we have, and then provide kind of scientific backing and, and other things like that. Uh, and then a lot of it is is learning, and then learning from your mistakes, and then adjusting over time. And so that's why we are have invested a lot in certain deployments in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. Is about. Um... Deep learning large, requires large data sets. They're not readily available in the medical space. What can be done about that? And before I, I ask you to address that, um, you, you know, in previous uh, versions of this workshop, we've had representation virtually every year from the FTA, and they've developed a certain amount of regulatory guidance around AI tools, and then they have some intermediate tests of the performance characteristics of the AI tools and stuff like that in a systematic way. The benefit of that is that that performance evaluation is part of a, a consortial effort across international regulators in which it's not just US FDA, it's this international consortium. So some of those approaches may be better for us to engage in and, and have some proof of concepts around trying to make these things ro robust enough and have enough objective data to allow generalized regulatory approvals in the future. But in terms of the medical data sets, um, what's your thinking? Because you know, you've already made a comment about, um, I think the word you used was privacy aware issues. 
there's so much skepticism in the public about the use of information and images and potentially, and in the medical space, this is you know absolutely a, a critical barrier. What's what's your approach to that problem? Yeah, a lot of it is investing in infrastructure where we can. Sorry, another echo again, but. Uh, um, another issue that we're investing heavily in is, is kind of this unsexy area of infrastructure, uh, both ourselves and then we work with a lot of our partners too to help inform them on ways that they can robustly de-identify, scale, aggregate uh, data collection and make it available um, for research. And it's kind of this interesting dynamic that you have to work on. I think we are still developing a lot of thought around this. You mentioned some of these, these other agencies uh, around the world have very different rules and different interpretations on data. And in many cases, actually, there's a lot of modernization. I think a lot of these regulatory agencies need to adopt in terms of understanding how data, the internet infrastructure works, but it really comes down to, can you build trust? Can you build the infrastructure to make DID cheaper? Uh, can you aggregate and be, and kind of show your work so that people can understand what's going on with their data? and then um, be able to feel comfortable with that or not comfortable and opt out of those kinds of things. And so we invest a lot in just generalized DID infrastructure, aggregation infrastructure. There's ideas now in kind of federated learning, allowing a lot of this work to happen locally so that the data never leaves specific areas, but gets aggregated in an anonymized way or a pseudo anonymized way uh, in the cloud. And so that's an area of research that we're very interested in. It's typically the unsexy type of research, but it's one that we know is really important for a foundation for doing R&D deployment in the future, too. Yeah, um, Daniel, we, we've we really, um, Chris Latham has helped us in the past and others in talking about this issue of um, engagement of communities in terms of the donation of data relative to tool development. And, and in a sense, this is an um, unrecognized problem in the public. And for us, it's a big deal, but you know, it, it just doesn't exist for the vast majority of the population of the planet. And one of the issues of building trust is to have use cases where you know, we demonstrate the importance of data and how data you know, develops tools. And one of the critical issues, again, in prevention in other spheres is the issue of equity. You know, you're, you're developing tools, uh, you know, optical tools to look for melanoma, and it turns out people with dark colored skin, these, these algorithms don't work. So how do we, you know, vaccinate to avoid these things and to um, ga engage the public in such ways that they will feel good about routine donations and, and, and understand that this is a pre-competitive public health issue and not just creating the next brood of, of billionaires? Yeah, it's a great question. I think one of the things that we think a lot about is equity. And so uh, what we try to focus on is you know, early on both describing the data we have so people have an understanding of what went into the model. And something we work on a lot here is this idea of model cards that we hope uh, will become more of a standard so that people will understand, okay, if you're using a model, here's how it works, here's the data that went in, here's some of the expectations you have about what could come out of these things. So at a baseline, there's more awareness that these models are not like cure-alls and have not solved every problem and have not like addressed every uh, specific demographic need. Uh, in addition to that too, though, we do have a lot of equity related research to better understand where models are strong, where they're not, and then how underlying model architecture uh, can make it easier to represent historically underrepresented uh, demographics and other parts, whether it's disease specific or just generally in the environment uh, or generally in the public rather. And so I think in many cases, we are still exploring this space, but it is an active area of research for us. And uh, we hope to have more about that in the future, but it is something that we know, you know, the same kind of biases that go into the data and the representation of how clinical care is done right now, uh, if you're not careful, um, can perpetuate those things. And so we want to make sure uh, that people are aware of these issues. And then hopefully that'll provide more incentive for disease registries for this kind of work, uh, for more um, uh, groups to be able to 
uh, focus on these types of this this type of research. You know, an area that we're actually really focused on too is getting what are called model embeddings out into the world, where we can get a model that generally understands a data type data problem, and then it requires folks who have a much smaller data sets to be able to build state-of-the-art models. And so that's another area of, of research we're doing. We just put out a paper and, and kind of open release some of this work too, where you can get to a state-of-the-art chest X-ray model with an order of magnitude or, or, or less data, basically. So it's on many different levels. There's data representation, there's data architecture. Uh, and I think as well with that compute dimension I was talking about earlier, we'll be able to access even more techniques to make this uh, more equitable. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, wonderful presentation, and thanks for your effort. We look forward to working on these problems with you. And right now, we'll have to transition.